today. Are we excited today? Yeah. Okay, I just want to like to break the cold a little bit, you know, start with some energy. And I want to introduce you guys uh, our new organizer, uh, Moises Moreno, who I have a lot of respect for. You are doing a really great job. And so I'll pass to the mic. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. So um, I want to welcome everybody here, uh, Pilsen residents, uh, even people from outside of Pilsen. We have some um, some dignitaries here in the building. Uh, we just have someone walking in from Chuy Garcia's office. I want to put you on blast, Javier? What's up? Um, so do we have the agenda? I wanted to show everyone. I don't think I had it. You guys kind of run run through it real quick. Because uh, I want to do like a quick slideshow before we introduce the panel, who we have our speakers. Actually, it's not there. Um, I had it on one of the sc screens, that one right there. So I know it's, bear with me now. So um, the purpose of us meeting here today is to discuss rent control, uh, rent stabilization, how can we address the issue of rising rents in Pilsen, especially people who are being pushed out, right? Um, property owners, renters, business owners. So wanted to run by real quick, kind of like the outline of our program. Um, right now we're doing the, the introductions. I want to introduce everyone, the panels that we have, the panelists. Uh, we want to have some testimonials, people who are being personally affected by the evictions and the, uh, the harassment. Uh, we would like to get a response from uh, State Rep. Teresa Ma, who's here with us today. Um, also followed up with Miguel Jimenez, who represents Metropolitan Tenants Organization. One of, where is Miguel at? Miguel, where are you at? Miguel? Gracias. Um, we also got Frank Avalon from the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. Uh, excellent, excellent resource to have. Uh, people who are facing evictions, he's, the, he's our go-to guy. Uh, we have a special guest here today. We have State Rep. Will Gazzardi uh, from the 39th District, correct? 39th District. Um, someone that had introduced the House Bill 2430, which seeks to lift the ban on rent control in the state of Illinois, which is currently illegal. So we're trying to see if we can um, have a good discussion today, see if we can change that law so we so the city of Chicago can uh, work on that, right? So that's important to have this discussion now. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Janet Smith. I know she's in the house here. Can I talk a little bit about, from UIC, Dr. Smith, thank you. Talk a little bit about rent control and stabilization in case people have questions, because it's, it's an issue that people need more information about. We want to dedicate at least 30 minutes, if possible, or more for you guys, the community, to ask questions to the panelists. Um, pretty much, we, we don't have a sign-in sheet, so uh, first come, first serve. Uh, if we can do that for 30 minutes, that'd be great. Uh, Joanza Malone from Lift the Band. Where's Joanza? Joanza Malone from Lift the Band Coalition. Uh, it's a coalition that the Pilsen Alliance is a part of to see if it's citywide organizations that can um, uh, work together with elected officials to see if we can get that, that, uh, that House bill passed. Um, and that's pretty much it, right? We want to close off kind of like what's going on, what the next steps are. So again, just a rundown with the agenda. Uh, I hope it's okay with you guys. I really wanted to focus on the community participation part so you guys can ask questions and uh, participate. That's, that's the point of having this town hall. Um, so I believe we introduced uh, the panelists, but one more time, we have uh, State Rep. Teresa Muff in the second district. Okay. Uh, Miguel Jimenez from Metropolitan Tenants Organization, uh, another panelist. Frank Avalon from Lawyers Committee for Better Housing, State Rep. Will Cazardi, thanks again for coming out down here, uh, Dr. Janet Smith, and I believe that's it for the panel. Um, so we're going to start right now uh, with some testimonials. Uh, we want to bring in some people from the community that can tell you their story, right? People who are being displaced. So our first uh, speaker is Diana Lily Sanchez Oriostegui. Orios, ¿Cómo se dice tu nombre? Perdón. Perdón, perdón. Uh, she's a Mexica Aztec dancer, uh, does Wisdom Keeper of the Elders, is uh, someone that's uh, a good person to have in the community, someone we're very happy that's willing to speak out on the issue. Uh, she's a seven-year resident of Pilsen and would like to stay here. Uh, she's uh, got her degree from Columbia College and she's currently single. <laughs> so, hey, I'm just putting what the note says. So, Diana, por favor, if you can please share your story with the community here. Gracias. Thank you, Moe. Ometeo, Mishpan Cinco, Tlokenowaki, Pelumawani, Lasokamati, At Ehek Lali Wantle. Thank you so much, everyone who is here. Ometeo, thank you to Creator for letting me be here. Esteemed guests, policymakers, decision makers, state 
representatives, uh, board members, and active citizens of Pilsen and beyond. Uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about who I am and how gentrification affected me in Pilsen, uh, not, not Lincoln Park, right? Not Wicker Park, right? Not Humble Park, but Pilsen. Uh, my name is Diana Lili Sanchez Quetzalcíhuatl and Mexicano. I'm a daughter of immigrant parents from Mexico. Uh, we're now dual citizens except for my dad. Uh, I'm a Mexicanistic dancer and wisdom keeper of my elders and it's my responsibility to share with every deserving person the ancient, ancient word of our elders. I ride a bike daily, all year round. I got here on, on bike. How many people biked here today? Thank you for biking. Thank you. This is one of the forms of healing with the earth uh, that we belong to and the earth that we live on. Uh, just a little bit uh, about how um, this came to be a very important to topic to me is because after living in New York for five years, I never had to pay more than 550 for rent. You know, if you go to New York and you look for rent that much, you'll find rent that much. Today in Pilsen, uh, you won't find that rent, even if you look for it. You won't find that. Uh, so I was living in um, Loomis at 18th Street for seven years. When um, How many people have moved here in the past seven years from their current home? Do you live in your current home more than seven years? See, some people live. So imagine living in your home for more than seven years, and then all of a sudden they say, hey, you got to go. You got to leave. Uh, that's what happened to me. And they gave me about 30 days to leave. They said, um, we're gonna, well, first of all, the building was sold to another, uh, another owner. And then they uh, hiked up, they hiked up the rent because they refurnished it or re, um, uh, remodeled it. And then they charged, uh, so from 550 that I was paying there, how many, who wants to guess how much the rent went up to? 1200 1200 You know, they raised the rent to 2500 So that's five times more than the rent that I paid. Now that was from one, one owner to a, the next new owner. So I, I question that. I know in New York, rent stabilization exists. Here in Chicago, we don't have that. Um, in February, I was asked to leave, and now I, ha I actually am faced with like, I, am I almost feel like I'm being bullied by the corporations who are buying the, uh, the estate here in Pilsen, and now I have to actually be forced to buy a house. Like, now I gotta go through the process of figuring out how to buy a house, what to do, right? Um, so I've never had to, to do that, um, and I'd like to actually um, question, you know, everyone who's here who was a decision maker, um, who can maybe make something to make some changes in that aspect. So, again, um, as we see our reflection of our culture and identity here in Pilsen more and more, and at the same time being sold, I'm here to remind us that this is not uh, something that happened overnight, but yet that. Lincoln Park, Wicker Park, Humble Park, our barrios cease to be barrios. So I wanted to thank uh, the Pilsen Alliance and everyone who's here um, for letting me speak my testimony of how I lived in a home and it, they jacked up the prices to 2,500 from 550. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Diana. Um, there are a lot of stories similar to Diana's. I mean, the Pilsen Alliance, we get people coming in all the time with similar stories. People are being evicted, getting their 30 day notice. Uh, we've had cases where uh, new owners come in and they cut off the light, they cut off the electricity, they cut off the water, they change the locks, um, even with people still living inside of it. So uh, it's definitely a crisis that we're having. And this is one example. Diana's one example of a renter, someone that wants to stay in Pilsen and build roots in Pilsen. So the challenge for us as a community is to help find people like you to, that can build roots, right, and, and afford to live here, right? Um, I'm going to pass the time for the tenants, right, to Miguel when, when the section comes, because I think he definitely should uh, share some information with you guys on renters' rights. Um, but give me one second, will you? Kind of winging it here, the agenda, so. Um, 
we have another uh, speaker. Uh, we wanted to bring a homeowner. We have a couple homeowners actually because we have some flex time here. Um, we wanted to bring in one homeowner, uh, Victoria Romero, uh, who lives on Bishop Street. Uh, someone that's been in the neighborhood pretty much your whole life, right? Uh, someone that wants to stay in Pilsen. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you, you know your your property's been getting uh, heavily solicited by uh, by developers, right? They want to buy your property, and, and would you want to come up here and share your story with us, por favor? Gracias, Vicky Romero. Sorry about my scratchy voice. I'm getting over allergies or a chest cold or something in Chicago. Um, it's probably the Aaron Pilsen. Um, but uh, my name is Vicky Romero. Uh, thank you to everyone, all the residents, all of our um, comrades and colleagues who support the Pilsen Alliance and their great work. Um, like Moises said, uh, I'm a lifelong Pilsen resident. Oh, closer? Okay. I uh, have lived on uh, 18th and Bishop my entire life. Um, my parents emigrated in the early 50s to that block and we've never left. But um, within the past 10 or 15 years, my mom uh, has consistently received uh, solicitations and letters from different developers, people offering cash to buy her home. And then since buying my home back in 2000, um, I've started to receive the same types of letters. On average, we receive about four to five letters per month that obviously we just toss in the garbage. But lately, I've actually been calling these guys back and uh, telling them, you know, take my mom's number, take my number off of your list. We're not interested in helping you gentrify my neighborhood. And some of them, unfortunately, are real estate agents who are also Latinos who are trying to catch on this wave of making money. And, um, you know, I tell them a little extra about how disgusted they make me um, doing this to their own community. Um, and so the Pilsen Alliance tries, I try as a resident um, and a community member to just um, do the best that we can to inform our neighbors and talk to one another and tell uh, the family members to hold on to their buildings, make sure that they keep their rents affordable. Yes, it's very tempting and enticing to rehab an apartment and then try to jack up the rent, um, like what happened with Diana. Uh, thankfully, my mother is committed to renting to community people and keeping rents at an affordable rate. And that's hard, given that the taxes are going up, now she has to pay for garbage pickup. Um, and so Bishop Street is kind of like a great example of what's happening across our neighborhood. We have uh, a rehab loft, empty warehouse building that was rehabbed about 12 years ago, uh, maybe 15 years ago now. And the average rent in that building for a two bedroom is close to $2,400. Um, a two bedroom in my mom's building goes for $800 a month. And so that's a huge difference. Um, and then our rents, you know, we try to keep the same, but in the meantime, like I said, we have property taxes going up, water bills going up, everything is constantly going up, and unfortunately, the, the tenants have to take the brunt of that imbalance in price. So um, that is my testimony. We have to try to stop um, these uh, speculators from coming in and taking advantage of money that's being made on the back of our community and we just have to be informed and talk to our neighbors. Um, for the newcomers who have come in, whether they consider themselves gentrifiers or not, we need to fold them in and make them part of the community. Uh, start talking to them. Let them know that if they are committed to living and staying in Pilsen, they need to get involved. They need to stay engaged. So um, just for further information, please stay in constant contact with the Pilsen Alliance. Hold all of the other community organizations accountable. Uh, you'll notice they're probably not here. Hold our politicians accountable, and I thank them for being here as well. Um, just on a side note, I've seen um, State Rep Ma at more community meetings here in Pilsen than I ever, ever saw Eddie Acevedo. And so I really thank you. Uh, for doing that. Um, and so that's just proof again that you don't have to be from our community to care about our community. And so thank you. I really want to point that out. So again, please keep in contact with the Pilsen Alliance. 
um, and keep up the good fight to keep our homes in our hands. Thank you so much. Gracias, gracias Vicky. Uh, again, another, another personal testimony from a homeowner, right? And we're hearing a lot of stories about uh, homeowners who are refusing to sell their properties and then getting city inspectors sent to, to you know, find out every little, every little thing that they can find wrong. And uh, we had one, uh, one property owner um, say that there is an actual website. So if your property is listed, they'll know that you have city code violations. They, they know that, so they'll try to use that to pressure you and say, hey, we can make that disappear. We can make these fines disappear, sell your property, boom. But you know, again, like Vicky says, you know, we wanna, we wanna sustain our communities, right? We want families to stay here uh, to, to, uh, to, to rebuild their homes so that people are not forced to leave, right? I think that's, that's a common thing. If anyone disagrees with me, please raise your hand because I think everyone that's here, everyone that lives in Pilsen wants to stay here um, and that's, that's what we're here for, right? We wanna make sure that we can keep communities together. Um, thank you. Let's see where we at. Um, we have another property owner, uh, another long time, very long time Pilsen resident, um, Jose Guerra, uh, someone uh, who family owns se several properties. Who can tell you a little bit about a little bit about uh, some of the solicitations again that are that are being received? So, Jose Guerra. How are you doing, everybody? Thank you, Teresa, Ma, for being here. We really appreciate it. I've been volunteering with Pilsen Alliance for almost six years, trying to help out the community. Uh, we've been having developers sending us letters, like everybody else. Some, I'm pretty sure some of you got them. My friends been throwing them out. I actually been calling them lately, and it's never them. It's always somebody else on the other line giving me the, the runaround. I've been telling them to stop sending us letters that we ain't selling because we have four properties in Pilsen. As well, they've been sending people from Kamed. Uh, the people, the developers stay in the van or in the cars, and that the uh, people that they send me, they go to the houses and they try to get to my house several times on the two buildings. Say that our meters from the light, they're on the second floor, which they always been in the basement for 37 years that we've been owning, owning the property. So I've, I've been trying to get, get the developers like run down with them to talk to them and they leave right away and they'll leave that person behind. So we won't find out who they are. I mean, on my phone I have pictures of the letters that they have sent me. And I mean, we're, we're frustrated. My parents are tired of this, that then trying to take our properties. And then too as well, they've been sending us the city inspectors a lot because they want our properties because we have two big buildings. So they want it. They want our properties and we don't, my parents be like, we ain't selling, we ain't getting rid of these properties. They work so much for them to have this. So, I mean, that's about everything that I could say about these developers, we gotta get, get them out of here. We don't need them, we ain't selling our properties. Thank you. Gracias, Jose, thank you. Uh, again, another another personal testimony. Um, we've been hearing reports about like fake fake addresses or something like that, Jose. About like you know like they're sending you letters and like like they don't even they're not even real or what? No, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I the reason I think that they because they gave us a t they gave us two tickets because in our properties we didn't have our name, my name, the owner, my number, and the street address. We didn't have it, and now since we put it there, they've been calling me. They've been sending us even more letters. And I think this was this is coming from the alderman's office. For them to, to we could put our properties on there, our information, they could keep calling us and sending us letters. I mean, they gave us two tickets because we didn't have the signs. Five hundred dollars a ticket. I mean, it's not right for them to be doing this to the people that we never had it, and now they want it out of a sudden. I mean, it's not right. Gracias, Jose. Thank you, Jose. Um, I do think we do have a couple more people who are willing to testify. I think uh, there will be community participation. Again, kind of run down the, the agenda. Um, I think this is a, a good opportunity uh, for State Rep. Teresa Ma. If we can just um, tell us how you feel with listening to Vicky, listening to este, to Jose, uh, to Diana, like you know, hearing personal stories from people. How does that make you feel? And you know, what what. What do you feel like what should be done? And there will be more time for questions, but just to get like an initial response. Por favor, gracias, Teresa. Thank you, Moy. Uh, hi, everybody. I want to thank Pilsen Alliance for putting together this town hall and uh, the speakers who gave testimony. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that um, you shared your stories, and I want to tell you right off the bat that um, I really appreciate hearing um, about your personal experiences 
I am very much interested in, in knowing, you know, what's happening on the ground in all the neighborhoods in my district. Pilsen is um, one of four neighborhoods that uh, make up the second district. Um, and, you know, I do spend a lot of time in Pilsen. Um, I care a lot about what happens here. And I'm very much aware of the uh, displacement and gentrification that's happening. And um, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I, I'm very much concerned. Um, I want to have a discussion with all of you. And I'm really grateful to be able to be a part of this panel to learn more and to um, have a discussion about uh, policy interventions that you know we may be able to undertake to um, address some of these issues. Um, let me tell you a little bit about um, my history and my relationship with um, uh, communities you know in the different places that I've lived. So you know I was born in San Francisco and I lived there until um, I went to college. And as many of you know, San Francisco is one of the most expensive cities to live in. It went through this um, process of gentrification, especially in the last uh, couple of decades, you know, with the rise of Silicon Valley, the tech industry, you know, there are uh, people who um, are able to live and work there who make tremendous amounts of money. And so they've priced a lot of the folks um, you know, out of the city, and it's very expensive to live. And I've also lived for a short time in New York City, where the same thing happened as well. Um, and in a lot of these places, you know, gentrification takes place, um, you know, in communities that uh, have invested, you know, have. Um, added value to neighborhoods that were uh, left, you know, pro probably, you know, in the process of white flight and deindustrialization. Um, Pilsen, at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, was a community that was um, built by Eastern Europeans. And uh, in the 20s and 30s, uh, Mexican Americans, Mexican immigrants lived um, on Halstead across from UIC and Hull House, right? That was known as the Mexican Main Street. And there was um, a displacement from that neighborhood. Um, many of the families who were displaced because of the construction of the highway and UIC um, moved into Pilsen at around the same time that the white European immigrants fled the neighborhood. Um, moved to the suburbs. And at the time, that departure um, and the deindustrialization, the uh, closing, moving of industry and jobs, leaving the area, it kind of um, dip, you know, brought down the, the uh, rents. And so it became much more affordable at around the same time that there was a need for um, Mexican immigrants to find um, a different part of the city to live in. And in the decades from the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, immigrant communities added the value back into Pilsen, built their businesses, um, improved their homes, and artists were part of that process too, creative folks, um, and made it a community that's vibrant and vital and uh, added so much value that you know now you know folks are moving in. They want to live here, and that's driving up a lot of the prices. Um, there are also folks that want to profiteer from this process, and I think that's you know what a lot of folks refer to. You know when these developers want to come in and um, you know jack up the prices. You know buy folks out, displace them, jack up the prices. Um, you know, that's not something that I support, and it's not what I like to see. Um, you know, I would love for us to figure out a way to keep um, families here, maintain affordability and livability of this community. Um, I'd like to see 
you know, greater participation in the democratic process and civic engagement. So, you know, pe more people have a say in um, the decisions that affect the quality of life and, you know, the uh, affordability of this neighborhood. So, uh, I'm committed to, you know, working with you, listening, working with my colleagues to, um, you know, figure out how we can make an impact um, in the area of public policy and uh, to make sure that, you know, people are not being displaced and um, priced out of a community that, you know, is, is really vital and wonderful and, and um, is the way that it is because of the contributions of uh, the immigrants who settled here. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Steve Redmar. Muchísimas gracias. Um, we do want to move forward on the agenda so we can uh, have our keynote speaker. Uh, but first, I wanted to recognize, uh, we have someone from Cook County, uh, Chuy Garcia's office, uh, Javier Ñañez, uh, who does assistance with property taxes. He's really good with, uh, with the property taxes. I've been to a couple of his workshops, so really, really good stuff. So please take advantage. Si necesita ayuda con los impuestos de propiedad, habla con Javier. Yeah. Okay, so ese es el señor que habla con él. Okay, um, I do, before we move forward, I missed something that I wanted to show. We got the slideshow. So um, the first slideshow will be one minute, because uh, we're talking about some of these developers, these, these developments, and the first uh, slide is uh, uh, a map of evictions in Pilsen from 2008 to May of 2017, so almost 10 years. Um, according to the UIC uh, public policy, uh, 10,000 Latino families have le left Pilsen. It's a, it's an often, often cited statistic, but I also wanted to kind of show the, the human's face of that. 5,000 of those people who have left have been evicted. Um, and we have, like, we've been able, lucky enough to get that information from the Lawyers Committee to Better Housing to find out who these families are, right? So we did a head count. Um, you want to go to the next slide? Or, so just to give you an example, these are some of the projects that, uh, that we've been facing in the community the last year. So one of them is the Gentry. This was the, 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 the paper factory, right, on Sangamon. So uh, Nelson Hill and uh, John Pagoni, we could never actually meet the guy. We don't even know if the guy is actually real, uh, but they wanted to call their building the Gentry, uh, charging uh, exaggerated rates. I think we did pressure them to lower down their, their rent. Uh, because of the, the public pressure that we did, we did some good organizing. Uh, so that's just one example, right? And uh, by the Paseo, that's a, a hot a hot spot for development now. So we want to do the next one? Yeah, keep, yeah, you go ahead. So yeah, that was our community meeting we had. It was well attended. Um, John Pagoni did not show up. We invited the alderman. He did not show up. He was actually at a Obama's farewell party. So I guess that was more important than uh, meeting the community. Uh, there was a, a big evictions going on in neighborhood Monroe management, I believe, like it's one example of Monroe management. Uh, it was a 1700 block of 21st place, they evicted the whole building. That's uh, just an example, you're gonna hear a lot about that, right? So we were there, we supported the, the tenants, and I believe they filed a lawsuit. Please correct me if, if I'm wrong, Byron. But there was a lawsuit filed against Monroe management because of the, they're just displacing people left and right, and I think that's just disgusting. Go ahead. Okay, this guy right here. Uh, that's Noah, Noah Gottlieb, I believe. He's one of the main developers for the, the 18th and Peoria uh, mega development that he had proposed right there, the park works. The guy did not want to uh, commit to any on-site affordable housing unit, not one. He, instead, he was committing to providing off-site affordable housing, um, literally saying that he's gonna buy everyone's house, <laughs> which was crazy, So, because we actually had a meeting right here in this room. That's just another artist ren rendering. It's right here, so <laughs> sorry the resolution's a little bad, but we actually got to meet the guy finally, right? We got to meet who these developers are, and uh, Jose Guerra, we were, we were there, like, we, you know, we, we asked some really tough questions. Um, he would not commit to any on-site affordable housing, so we felt like it was not in good faith for the community, so we turned him down. Um, just, again, you know, wasn't, he wasn't willing to afford it. Uh, providing affordable housing on site, and that's something that uh, we're pushing hard for. Right. <sighs> this guy right here, Andy Ahitao. This is the gentleman from City Pads who purchased Casa Slan. Uh, this is what Casa, the outside of the facade looked like prior to him purchasing the property, and then what happened afterwards, right? So we actually met with this guy. Um, yeah, thank you. We actually met with Andy. Uh, we're trying to uh, work with him to see if he can provide some affordable housing unit. He's going to turn all these into luxury apartments, uh, $1,000 per unit. So a four-bedroom apartment would cost $4,000, and we uh, try to work with him to lower his rents. He refused to do so. 
Um, we, just, we had a community vigil. Uh, we're still in the process of working a community benefits agreement with City Pets. They are also purchasing properties in Uptown, and they are displacing uh, displacing men there in SRO. So we feel that again, City Pets is another example of uh, bad neighbors, right? And we need to keep putting pressure on them, uh, whether they like it or not, right? Okay. So we're almost done with the slideshow. So right here, it kind of highlights who the biggest landlords who are evicting people in Pilsen by year. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little cut off here in 2017, it's not over yet, but Monroe Management, Related Management, Wells Fargo, US Bank, East Lake Management, H.J. Russell, these are all corporations, right? And it's the year and the number of evictions that they're uh, court cases, right? Um, again, these are entities, these are corporations that are coming in, buying up properties and telling everyone to leave. Uh, we feel that's not fair, right? So just wanted to, hey, full disclosure, these are the people, these are the entities, I'm sure that they donate to um, to elected officials as well. Okay. okay, so we have an affordable housing crisis in Pilsen. I'm just gonna read this as it's written here. Pilsen has lost affordable housing units because developers pay fines instead of offering affordable on-site units, like I mentioned with the, the park works. So instead of providing affordable housing units, they pay a fine because it's cheaper for them. Over the past five years, the community has lost over $3 million of affordable housing that developers have paid in fees to avoid building uh, affordable housing, at least 35 units, while 350 luxury units were added. Those $3 million never came back to the community based on the affordable affordability requirement ordinance that the city and all the solis do not enforce. So that's a big problem that we're, trying to, that we're trying to address, is how do we not let these developers get away with not providing uh, on, you know, on-site affordable housing. So that's something that we're gonna be working with. Um, I know we have someone from TRP here, but I do wanna uh, highlight that uh, the Resurrection Project has evicted approximately 41 tenants since 2008. Um, we do think that's a yellow flag or an orange flag from my perspective. I think we do need to have an open discussion with the Resurrection Project on evictions, on rent control, on tenants' rights. So I think hopefully that's a conversation we can have with the Resurrection Project because we do want to have a good relationship with them. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that housing is secured for evicted tenants. We don't want nobody uh, left homeless or on the streets, again, because uh, for a lot of people, uh, TRP is like the last stop. If there's, you can't find an affordable unit, that's it. So we want to work with them. Uh, we also want um, the Pilsen Land Use Committee to adhere to 21% affordable housing. That's the, the mandate that they agreed upon, uh, that the alderman has also agreed upon. So we want to make sure they stick to that. That's kind of the reason why they're not um, providing affordable units, because they're paying out of it. So we want to make sure that they commit to the mandate. Uh, and last but not least, we would like to host, be participate in public pluck meetings, right? Because we don't know uh, where these meetings are taking place. We don't know who's there. We don't know who's, who's making these decisions on the behalf of the community. All we're asking for is transparency and public participation. That's all we're asking for. And that's it. Let me see what else. Is that it? That's it. So I just wanted to kind of crash course who these who these developers are, who are they, you know, who are the ones that are doing the evicting, and kind of some of the challenges that we're facing. I don't want to take any more time because we have a panel that uh, wants to, you know, we we've got to get this program going. Um, I'm gonna, Rosa, are you ready? So I'm gonna pass it back to our moderator, Rosa Esquivel, um, who's gonna introduce the the panelists one at a time. Is that okay? Thank you guys for your patience. Okay, so before uh, I introduce um, the panelists one by one, I just want to say something. Um, so I've been uh, volunteering for Pilsen Alliance, Alliance for two years now. And in those two years, I've been seeing how people are being treated. And they are being treated like they're not humans. And we shouldn't even be here talking about affordable housing. This is a right. This should be a right that every human being has. Okay? And I just don't understand how people can do that to uh, elderly people, to the children. You know, there's a big stress that you go through when you are being evicted especially when you have a family and when you have children. So everybody out here, the only thing I'm gonna say is we have to think about humans first. We have to put human life for profit. Oh, I guess it turned out. We have to think about human life before profit, okay? Because there has to be something farther 
than just making money out of the suffering of the people. So I just want to make that clear and just try to plead to your hearts and to your minds and see a bigger picture here. These are people. These are human beings. So uh, I want to introduce um, uh, the speaker of Tenant Rights MTO, Miguel Jimenez. Oh, sorry. Tired of so I guess you know. Speak up. You have to. I guess I'm going to have to yell a little bit, uh, but that's okay. I have to speak loud like theater. Uh, well, scre screaming is good at a community forum, I think. Uh, we should all scream some more and continue screaming in this community. Uh, my name is Miguel Jimenez. I'm a community organizer with the, organizer with the Metropolitan Tennis Organization. Organized tenants in buildings in, uh, throughout Chicago, uh, including here at Pilsen. I'm also a former resident of Pilsen, a uh, visual artist. I lived in Pilsen uh, work, doing cultural organizing uh, for many years. So, part of my heart is in this community. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm here today is to talk, talk a little bit about tenant rights. Uh, the Metropolitan Tenants Organization uh, was very instrumental in passing the uh, tenant Housing Bill of Rights in the 1980s, uh, which was organized by a Tenants Congress back in the 80s, and it was the first kind of that, that type of ordinance in the Midwest, in Chicago. So we're very fortunate, and I always tell tenants that we're very fortunate that we have a, a Tenants Bill of Rights or Tenant Rights Ordinance in Chicago, because other cities don't. And that gives tenants a lot of leverage and a lot of power to exert their rights and their housing rights, not only in their own particular situations, but also as organized uh, in their communities as well. And as uh, was mentioned earlier, there have been a lot of families leaving Pilsen. We know that 10,000 is the number we all talk about. That's displacement, right? So what are the instruments of displacement? One of the biggest instruments of displacement are, is evictions. Evictions are like the magic wand for developers and for any landlord who wants to uh, clear his building for whatever reason. And we all know, and Frank will talk about this later probably, uh, uh, there is no just cause evictions ordinance in Illinois or in Chicago. So one of your rights as a tenant, for well, those of you who may not know, uh, we do have a lot of information about your rights here at the table individually. You can talk to me or Mr. Green, our volunteer. Uh, but basically, for somebody who don't know, if you have, uh, if you're living on a month-to-month -month lease, there is no way that the uh, landlord can evict you without giving you a 30-day notice. Now, a lot of you say, well, you know, we hear a lot of tenants saying that if you get a five-day five -day eviction notice, that you gotta leave in five days. I've heard this. Oh, I gotta get out of my place in five days. No, you got five days to pay your rent. And then the eviction process may start. <coughs> the other thing is, uh, if you're living month to month, you do have the right to ask for repairs. Now we tell many tenants that uh, continue paying your rent even though the roof is falling on you. This is a lot of anger that tenants have, especially in foreclosure cases where well, if the landlord's not paying his mortgage, I'm not gonna pay my rent, right? So what happens to you if you don't pay your rent? It's not a rhetorical question. You get evicted. Right, you get evicted. And unfortunately, a lot of our people, a lot of the people in our communities, especially in immigrant communities, don't understand how the system works. Don't understand how the court system works. Don't understand, uh, Judges don't understand that landlords can get lawyers, don't understand any of that stuff. In fact, they're very afraid to rock the boat. They're very afraid to exert their rights. And that's where we come in. And that's where you come in. Because we need to spread the word. We need to tell tenants. And if you're landlords, and if you're tenants, you have rights. You need to tell them. You don't need to move in a week because your landlord tells you, you gotta be out of here in a week because I want my sister-in-law to move into the basement. 
And I can stand up here for hours telling you the kind of stories we hear. We have a Metropolitan Tenants Organization has a hotline for tenants. We have the information here. We receive over 10,000 calls a year about tenant landlord issues. Based on those calls, we organize in buildings so that tenants can form tenant associations. And that's, it's not just for the tenants to exert power against a management company or a landlord, but it's for tenants to organize in the community and to maintain their communities affordable. And your tenant rights do that. Now, besides the fact that you get a five-day notice or you get a 30-day notice uh, to uh, move, if you have a lease, and we've seen this happen, uh, some of these developers come in and give tenants 30-day notices, even though they have leases. Is that legal? Some people are going, no, I don't know, maybe. No, if you have a lease, you have a contract, you're paying for an entire year, why do I need to move in 30 days? We've seen this in buildings where a developer will come in and give everybody in the building, leaseholders and non-leaseholders, eviction notices, 30-day notices to move. Some of these tenants are disabled. Some of these tenants are, are veterans. Some of these tenants live in SROs. We work in, uh, we're working in SRO now in Bridgeport where that's happening. So we stop it. So in terms of your rights, I advise everybody who doesn't know their rights to pick up this information and to start learning. One of the instruments that we need to have is knowledge. If we do not have knowledge, we cannot fight back, right? Ignorance is not bliss. Knowledge is bliss. So all these instruments that uh, developers have, notices, uh, ability, an ability to pay for uh, $300 uh, an hour for a lawyer to get you out of, out of your place, that's the advantage they have. We don't have that advantage or that luxury, right? We need to have knowledge. We need to, we need to think of housing as a human right. We need to get beyond our individual situations in our housing and think of it as a human right, just like we think about everything else as a human right. This is a human right crisis, human rights crisis in Pilsen. And we need to frame it that way. We need to think about it that way because we are being displaced. And just to wrap it up, I, I'd like to think about this as going through a history of colonialization in our own countries and here. And I feel like we're being re recolonized. They're coming back and they're taking their land and they're taking their housing. And we're, once again, we're, we're, we're being uh, uh, treat it like we have no dignity, no humanity. And I hear this from tenants all the time. This is not something I'm saying. This is something that I hear tenants say, and I heard them say it today. I mean, we want to be treated like we have humanity. It is a sad thing to say that people feel that. But I think that uh, in terms of our tenant rights, we do workshops. If you have information, I can do, I'm a housing counselor. If you want to talk to me about your individual situation, you can approach me or Mr. Green, who's an expert in housing as well. And I want to turn it over to Frank, right? Is that correct? I'll turn it over to Frank. All right, yes. thank you. Uh, so our next speaker is... Some numbers. There are 670,000 rental units in the city of Chicago. Wow. At just 2.8 people in each of those rental units, and we're talking about half of the population of the entire city are renters. Yeah. Now the American dream that those with wealth would have you believe that renting is just a temporary status on the way to being a homeowner. Well, 
I will bless you and say you are a full-fledged American by being a renter. Congratulations. <laughs> there are 30,000 eviction cases filed in the city of Chicago every single year. Five courtrooms at the Daily Center from 9.30 to 11 o'clock have 40 to 80 cases per docket. Do the math. That's one minute and 44 seconds per trial. There's nothing like due process going on in eviction court. Almost everybody is evicted. Another number. The foreclosure crisis is not over. 80,000 rental units in Chicago have been affected by the foreclosure crisis and continue to be. Chicago and Illinois might be blue cities and blue states, but they are far from progressive. The only progressive law that we have in this city relates to special protections for renters that live in foreclosed properties, and that law is only from 2013. Okay, step back. Aside from numbers, housing is a basic human need. But deeper than that, more profound from that, is housing is the platform from which other meaningful life activities spring. School, relatives, friends, church, sense of neighborliness, our sense of place, our sense of anchor, our sense of belonging as human being is connected with that physical place where we live. And without that, we are without roots. The goal then is to <coughs> lay down roots. So if housing is a basic human need, that deeper means much more than that, then it ought to be a fundamental human right. It is not. And just as there should not be a profit motive in healthcare at all, there should be a diminished profit motive when it comes to housing. But we know that American policy since World War II has tried everything it can to augment the profit motive when it comes to housing in America. Public-private partnerships fancy way of putting money into the pockets of a handful of people. So what I want us to do for a minute is to start imagining what if the global failure of capitalism we witness every day, what if we imagine a neighborhood called Pilsen where profit is not the first thing, but people are. This is such a wild idea. It's really only since 1980 in America that we have bowed down to the statue of profit being first. I could show you a picture of 1890s Pilsen, and it looks very different than it does today. Yeah? And we know, if nothing else, we know that there is change embedded into the very molecular structure of this world. And so we know that Pilsen, 20 years from now, will not look like it does today. The question then is, who gets to decide? Do you get to decide? Or does a handful of people with a lot of money get to decide? Who has a right to the city and who gets to decide? So I want us to envision for a second, what does this neighborhood look like where our profit is secondary and people are first? There's a lot of pieces to that picture, a lot of pieces to that puzzle. We could name 10 of them off the top of our heads, but I just want to talk about three. Certainly to have a stable neighborhood where people can thrive and put down roots, the first <coughs> principle of housing as a human right must be that people have an expectation that they can stay there. From a legal point of view, we call this just cause for eviction. That you can't just be given a 30-day notice and have done absolutely nothing wrong, and then it's off to eviction court with you. 
So just cause for eviction is the law in three states and 27 cities across America. We know it well, we know that it works. It is not in Illinois, it is not in Chicago. Rent control or rent stabilization that Professor Smith is going to speak with you about and Representative Gazzari is a good way to make neighborhoods affordable over a long period of time, but when paired with just cause for eviction, they work together to create a stable neighborhood. But those two things aren't the whole picture. There's a third thing that is roaming through Chicago right now, proactive rental inspection. You know, and I know, that the current inspection regime for your, the way gentrifiers come by your property is because your landlord makes so much profit by not reinvesting in the property, it falls into disrepair, makes it a target for someone to buy it at a profit, who will then put in a granite top, countertop and jack up the rent by 500 bucks a month. So disrepair and foreclosure are major reasons for displacement and gentrification. How do we deal with disrepair in rental housing? Instead of having a reactive, complaint-based system like we do in Chicago, where the tenant has to tolerate and tolerate and tolerate and tolerate Big birth of the cockroach under her kid's bed forever until she gets tired about it and starts complaining to the landlord and eventually ratting their landlord out to the building department. And what does Mr. Landlord do? Landlords in my scenario are always Mr. <laughs> Mr. Landlord then retaliates by filing eviction cases, by raising the rent, etc. So if landlords, like is the case in 19 cities around the United States, if landlords were required to fall under an inspection regime where every five years their property is merely inspected proactively so that the tenant now doesn't need to complain, there'll be a user fee that'll get passed on to the tenants, but it's so cheap that most renters would gladly have their rent increased by $40. Gradually over time, maybe a decade, all the properties in the city reach some basic level stable, habitable, safe, decent condition. So there's lots of pieces to this people first way of looking at housing. Rent stabilization, just cause for eviction, proactive rental inspection are just three. There are many others. I wanted to just highlight those three for you today. So 670,000 units strong. I wonder what would happen if we all showed up. <laughs> keynote speaker and he's going to talk about uh, a bill that is called HB 2430 a state representative will be starting thank you so much Thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, thank you to Pilsen Alliance uh, and thank you to all of you for being here tonight. Muchas gracias para la invitación. Quiero agradecer a Pilsen Alliance y a ustedes para venir aquí a discutir ese contenido. I, my, my name is Will Gazzardi. I'm state representative from the 39th district. Uh, my district is on the northwest side of Chicago. I represent Logan Square. And, thanks. Are we back on? Oh, not yet. right into it. Okay. I'm just going to keep talking and it's going to get louder at some point. Um, my name is Will Gazzardi, state rep from the northwest side. Logan Square, Belmont Cregan, Hermosa, Portage Park. Uh, Mi nombre es Will Gustari, soy representante estatal del Distrito 39 en uh, el Partido Nordoeste de la Ciudad de Logan Square, Hermosa, Belmont, Craigan, Portage Park. Uh, and many of the challenges uh, facing this community 
we have already experienced them uh, in, in my area, right, in Logan Square. Uh, we are dealing, we're, I would say, maybe a few years ahead of you guys on uh, a lot of these problems. Uh, El barrio a donde vive yo, uh, Logan Square, uh, hemos, uh, bueno, uh, tenemos las mis los mismos problemas que ustedes aquí tengan, uh, sobre, especialmente sobre uh, uh, los, uh, los subidos de la renta, right? Especially uh, when it comes to, to increases in rent, we've seen a lot of these same challenges. Um, and so, uh, Frank did a really good job of explaining the sort of big picture, and I want to talk specifically about one piece of legislation that we're working on uh, and, uh, and tell you about why I think it's important and why I, I need your help in getting it passed. Uh, quiero hablar con ustedes sobre un, uh, una, un propuesto de ley que estoy trabajando en, en Springfield uh, y quiero pedirles su, su apoyo en, en uh, pasando. Entonces, um, when we think about development, we think about it as a city question, a question for the aldermen, right? Cuando pensamos de, de uh, development, desarrollo, sí. Pensamos en la ciudad, en en el concejal, sí. Es él que decide cómo va, cuáles desarrollos van a van a hacer en nuestras comunidades. So, as as a state legislator, I wondered, I live in Logan Square, I see all these changes happening in my neighborhood, and I wondered what is it that we at the state level can do to intervene, to try to make our communities more stable, to keep the rents from going up. Yo, yo no trabajo en la ciudad, uh, trabajo en Springfield, y uh, bueno, bueno, estoy pensando qué podemos hacer en el gobierno estatal para, uh, para atacar ese problema. Um, and I learned in, in, try, in thinking about this question that in fact, the state has this crazy law that we need to change. Yo aprendí que el gobierno estatal tiene una ley ridículo que tenemos que cambiar. And here's, here's, the, here's the situation. Um, the city of Chicago, uh, oh boy, rent control is another vocabulary I don't know what help with. Control de renta, okay. Okay, I'm learning with you guys. Today. Um, uh, the the state of Illinois, sorry, the city of Chicago is forbidden by state law uh, to consider rent control ordinances. The state says cities do not have the right to pass rent control. Period. What business is it of the state to make this decision? Who knows. But the state passed this law in 1995 to prohibit cities uh, from passing rent control ordinances. Hay una ley en el estado de Illinois que prohíbe, gracias, prohíbe a la ciudad de Chicago y todas las ciudades en el estado de Illinois de pasar leyes sobre control de renta. Entonces, this, okay, so this seems crazy to me, right? Cities, we, as residents of Chicago, we have the right, we should have the right to make decisions about how our communities ought to look. And we should have the right to offer protections to our citizens, right? But the state has deprived all of the cities in Illinois of this right. Uh, it's called the Rent Control Preemption Act. Um, and it has been in effect for over 20 years now in Illinois. Um, and it's my view that we need to figure out a way to get this thing off the books. Uh, we need to figure out a way to change the law. Not that every community in, in the state of Illinois needs to have rent control, but simply that communities should have the right to make that decision. Right? The city of Chicago and cities all over the state should have the right to make the decision. Uh, entonces, yo creo que necesitamos cambiar esa ley para que la ciudad de Chicago y todas las ciudades en el estado de Illinois uh, puedan uh, pensar en esas leyes, no que necesitan uh, pasar leyes sobre control de renta, pero que podemos decidir nosotros, cada ciudad, lo que queremos hacer sobre la renta. Um, so, okay, so I went down to Springfield this year and I introduced uh, a bill called House Bill 2430. Uh, I worked on figuring out the language with uh, a number of the groups who are in this room tonight, as well as many other uh, allies in this fight. Um, and Representative Ma has been a, a co-sponsor and a champion of this bill since we first introduced it. Um, 
bueno, uh, he introducido un profesor de ley uh, que se llama Hospital 2430 para, para cambiar esa ley, uh, representante Ma y todos la grup uh, los, los grupos que están aquí uh, esta noche, estamos luchando juntos para, para crear esa ley. Um, but I have to tell you the honest truth about this, which is that we are losing this battle in Springfield. And the more sort of embarrassing truth is that we're getting out organized. I expect that we are going to get outspent in these fights, right? We're, who are we going up against? We're going up against the realtors who have all the money, right? So they're going to come after us. You expect that. But we are getting out organized by these guys, and that we should be beating them in that department. Uh, bueno, estamos perdiendo esta lucha en Springfield um, para esa ley. Y Es no solamente un problema de dinero, porque ellos, nuestros oposantes, tienen más dinero que nosotros, es uh, evidente, pero también están organizando ellos mejor que nosotros. Y nosotros ten tenemos que organizarnos uh, mejor, mejor que ellos, mejor que estamos haciendo ahora, para que podemos ganar esa lucha. Um, we're the organizers, right? Uh, but I have to tell you, in, in my conversations with my colleagues, and Representative Ma can, can confirm this with you, they had gotten hundreds of emails from realtors in their community saying, no, 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 we need, we can't have rent control. Please, 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 don't give us rent control. And they haven't heard from us, from the 650,000 rental units in the city of Chicago, from the people in our community, in Logan Square, in Pilsen, in Uptown, in Brownsville, in every neighborhood in Chicago, the people who day in and day out are getting screwed over by landlords who are trying to take every dime they can out of our pockets. They have not heard from us. And that's the problem. Nuestros colegas in Springfield uh, hemos hablado con ellos sobre esa propuesta y, y uh, nos hemos decidido, uh, nos dicen, <laughs> disculpen mi español, es, hace mucho tiempo que no lo hago, pero uh, nos dicen que uh, no han recibido muchos uh, correos electrónicos de nosotros, pero de los realtors y los oposantes de esa propuesta, han recibido muchos, 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 cada día, muchos uh, correos electrónicos diciendo no rent control, no control de renta. Uh, entonces, si queremos ganar esa lucha, nosotros... Nosotros... Sí, sirve. Bueno, uh, nosotros tenemos que organizarnos mejor y que... Uh, 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 meter la presión sobre los, los, nuestros colegas en Springfield. Um, so how do, we, how do we win these fights? There's a lot of fights in the legislature that work like this, where we, the interests of our constituents and our communities, uh, are opposed to the interests of the very wealthy, right? Uh, and those guys happen to have a lot of influence in the halls of power. Right? We know, and we can get into a whole conversation about how campaign finance works and why it's so terrible, but um, the people with money, unsurprisingly, have lots of interest and influence in controlling the way that Springfield works. Um, and then there's the rest of us who are trying to get by and who are trying to change the law to make our world more just. Right? Um, and a lot of times we lose these fights. Right? But every once in a while, we're able to break through and win. And the way we do is by taking up common cause together and by exposing injustice for what it is, right? By telling a clear story about what's truly going on in our communities. That this is not a question, you know, not, not allowing our opponents to sort of confuse the question, but to make it a simple question about basic human decency. The way the speaker so far tonight, or the way Diana was talking about the story that she dealt with in her life, that I think all of us heard that story and, and felt it and understood it, right? And the way that Frank sort of laid bare, uh, you know, described to us thinking about this story in, in greater terms, about the basic sort of needs for housing, right? Um, we have to be able to communicate this story clearly and powerfully. Uh, and in order to break through the noise of all the money and power and interest in Springfield, it's going to take us organizing better. 
So to everyone who's here in this room, who cares, I'm gonna have a lot to translate in there. For every, <laughs> but I'm on a roll now, I gotta get going. Um, for everyone who's here in this room who cares about uh, making rent affordable, keeping our communities stable, uh, building justice in our neighborhoods, um, we are in unusually trying times. The neighborhood of Pilsen is in unusually trying times. The city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, the country, we are facing exceptional challenges, right? This is not your ordinary moment in history. Um, and in these exceptional challenges, in these extraordinary times, we, each of us, we are each called upon to take exceptional responsibility for making the world the kind of world we want it to be. So showing up to a meeting is wonderful, but I, I want to challenge each of you, instead of going home and bemoaning the state of things uh, in the city, in our community. Know that we each have a responsibility to take on more of this fight. That we can't let ourselves get out-organized by the gosh darn association of realtors, right? We're the organizers, you guys are, each of you in this room. So go organize, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, build awareness about this issue. Because I guarantee you, you know 10 people who think that rent control is a great idea, who have no idea that it is completely illegal in the state of Illinois. Right, I bet many of you didn't know that when you walked in this room tonight. And you guys are informed and passionate people. So help us, help me, help Representative Ma, help us organize around this issue, help us lift it up, help us tell the story about why this is wrong and what needs to be fixed. That is our calling in this moment, not just on this issue, but in so many areas. We're called to do more right now. So I implore you to take the lessons of tonight upon yourselves and to take that extra step, to take that extra degree of responsibility, to fight the extraordinary challenges with extraordinary measures. Okay, en español. <laughs> um, I don't even remember half what I said. Pero pues, para... Um, Los, los problemas que encontramos ahora, uh, ahora mismo en la ciudad, en Pilsen, y también uh, en el país, uh, con nuestro presidente y todo eso, bueno, son muy grandes problemas, sí. Uh, y para, para combatir esos grandes problemas, uh, necesitamos cada uno hacer más que normal, sí. Uh, necesitamos cada uno uh, uh, hablar con nuestros vecinos, hablar con la comunidad. Uh, hay muchas personas que, uh, que no saben que el control de renta es ilegal en Illinois. Entonces, tenemos una respons responsabilidad de hablar con los vecinos, hablar con la comunidad. Uh, y, y bueno, juntos, la, la única uh, posibilidad De, de combatir uh, las fuerzas más grandes y más poderosas que nosotros, es que unirnos como comunidad, como ciudad, como Estado, y, y luchar contra ellos juntos. Entonces, es, mi, es lo que pregunto yo a ustedes uh, cuando terminamos esa, esa junta, esa reunión. Uh, por favor, hable con sus vecinos. Di, di, diles lo que importa in this area, and together we can win this fight. Muchas gracias. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much, Rogosari. A big applause for Rogosari for doing this for our communities. Um, so next, uh, we have uh, Dr. Janice Smith, and she's going to talk about rent control and stabilization. especially because I think what you need following the comments um, of Representative Guzardi is what ammunition can we have to organize with and be prepared to fight back against the common things that people say why we shouldn't have rent control. So I wanted just to kind of go through some of those things to give you what we would call the ammunition. I hate that reference of using guns or something like that, but we do have to think of some. what are we going to use to fight this um, fight because it's a big one. And the realtors are a huge lobbying group, right? And it's 
there's a larger sort of apparatus behind that at the national level too that gives them a lot of good information and research that gives them the, the, the basis for making the claims that they want to make, but we have to be able to counter them. So first I want to just make sure you understand rent stabilization as a broad term. Often we think of rent control, that's one form of it. Um, it really began as a concept in World War I in Europe, not so much in the U.S. and Europe, and it was to freeze rents, completely freeze them at that time, because they saw rents were rising rapidly and taking advantage of a war situation. Same thing happened in World War II in the United States, which was to raise, uh, to, to have rent control. However, it wasn't a freeze as much, it was it, what we see now as a contemporary idea of rent control, which is where you have um, the ability to raise rent, but at a limited amount, right, every year. So you control it, maybe for inflation, or to keep it from being out of control, like the stories we heard today. Um, and actually, in New York City at the time, they, they said that we wanted to prevent speculative, unwarranted, and abnormal rent increases during the war. And what they actually did was went back in time and set the standard for what the rent could be because they'd already had rent increases happen. And I think that's something to think about here because Pilsen's already seeing a lot of rent, being, you know, the rent's going up a lot. And how do we even get more bold about it and say, let's go back to, I don't know, 2016 prices. Um, so then, now we start to see rent control kind of rise again as an interest in the United States in the 1960s and 70s. It wasn't a war as much as it was double-digit inflation. And so renters were really feeling the pain, and so you see organizing really taking hold here. So it took war twice, and then it took organizing, right? So you have people organizing, and, and as we look at contemporary time, we have about 140 to 150 cities um, around the United States with rent control or some sort of rent stabilization program in place. Um, now, what is important to think about is, in the United States, rent control is not a freeze. It's something that's usually set, like I said earlier, where it's an adjustment, um, an agreed upon adjustment, um, that, and then there's a sort of a survey that's done to kind of look at what's going on. I think the one thing that is important to know is that most of the research done to date on rent control has been done by economists. Does anyone know why that might be a problem? <laughs> Some of my best friends are economists, usually political economists, those are good kind. Um, but the reason I point this out is because they start from the assumption that rent control is an interference in the market, not an intervention, which is what planners would say, that's my background, an interference in the market. And by the very nature of being inter in interference, it is not going to be an effective tool. It is going to cause more problems than good. However, research that's been done more recently um, by researchers that I know at, at U um, University of California, Berkeley, have been able to document through their data that rent control does prevent displacement. This is not something economists really care about necessarily in their research. So I think it's important we can use that research. There's other research that's been done, I'll talk about at the end, that helps us support that as well. So it's good to know still how the economists view this because you have to be able to counter their positions. And so I want to just talk through a couple of those positions. Um, I think that also, I'm just gonna kind of skip ahead to some things. Um, one of the things that I just wanna also note is that a, a big topic these days against rent control is to say we can build ourselves out of this problem. Right, so we have the ARO, the Affordable Rights, uh, uh, Rent uh, uh, Ordinance. What does it do? It'll give us, for every 100 units that are built, we'll get 10 affordable and we'll get 90 that aren't. Is that building ourselves out of it? No, it's just giving us more expensive housing for very little new affordable housing to solve a problem that is huge. So I think we have to first think that. But the other thing is, if it really is the solution, then we shouldn't have an affordable housing problem, right? Because we're building a lot of luxury housing. A lot of empty luxury housing, by the way. I live in Furnace Row and I look at a lot of dark windows, except for Airbnb when it's hot during Lollapalooza. <laughs> just saying. Okay, so let's just think about this. Um, the major concern about rent stabilization in private market um, is that it often targets a geography. So if you think about this, if we targeted Pilsen or we identified those communities that we think are most at risk, for people being displaced. Then what can happen in a city like Chicago is you have some areas that are targeted and have rent control and some that don't. And most of the research has looked at this and they find that it creates what we call a dual market. So you have a rent controlled market and you have a non-rent controlled market. And most of the research shows that the rent control actually does do what we want it to do. 
it keeps the prices lower, it keeps people in place. And the non-rent controlled areas though, what happens is the rents go up. So this is a, an unfair situation. What could be a solution to that? Have rent control everywhere. And you know what, Those, that 600,000 people that we were talking about, 600,000 renter households, they're all allies now, right? We're all in it together. I mean, I think there's some rich people I know who pay a lot of money for rent who'd be okay with that. So anyway, just to think about that, but that's most of the research is trying to, to get at that. Um, so they think, uh, the other thing is that there can be some concerns about vacancy rates being affected. We can deal with that and we can talk more about how we could deal with that. But so there's a, here's some key things to, to kind of counter or think about. One is they talk about the tenants becoming immobile, that is the ability to move, that they end up staying put. I don't know if that's a problem necessarily. <laughs> But they feel that you know, if they have limited choices, right? They can only live in those areas of the rent control. What it does do, or could do, if that is the case, is that sometimes people may stay put, and then like their job changes, so they have to drive further, or they find transportation options. We can think about that. Again, if we have rent control everywhere, I don't think that's necessarily going to be as much of a problem. Um, so the other thing is they talk about misallocation. If you hear this term, misallocation, it means that you are living in an apartment that's either too big for your needs or too small for your needs. Like, right, you maybe, if you're, it's too small, it's called overcrowded. <laughs> if it's too big, it's called, you've got enough money to spend on a three bedroom and you only need a two, good for you. Um, sometimes people need them for their dogs and things like when you watch how people shop for rental housing, it's amazing. But what I would say is that there is no such thing as um, allocation being a pure science. That is, we can't tell everyone where to live by the housing, the housing size. What does dictate that is what you can afford. So we should be more concerned about the overcrowding problem, first of all, less concerned about those who are in too big of a house. Um, and so I think that's something we can, we can start talking about, is how do we use that overcrowding concern also to justify rent, um, rent control or rent stabilization. Another concern is that landlords won't maintain their property. Well, we heard from Frank actually a solution to that, so we could just skip that problem. But what the research has shown, and I can give you resources to look at, is that yes, there is probably a likelihood that um, some units are not maintained as well, but if you have in place strategies that can offset that, such as a proactive um, you know, uh, uh, maintenance pro, um, rules or inspection rules, then you can actually probably reduce that problem. The other thing you can do is that if it costs money to maintain an apartment, why don't we do like we have actually available in Cook County, which is some tax breaks to landlords. Larger landlords now can get tax breaks if they fix their apartments and keep the units affordable. So there's a solution. So, so far we have no, we have, we have counter um, positions to everything they're talking about. Condo conversions comes up as well. We've seen the research does show that condos, that people, landlords will decide to get out of the business of being a landlord and convert a rental property to a condo. So it's a risk, this is true. But we also have condo conversion strategies too. We can have first right of refusal for the tenants living in those units. We could also do like we did with the SRO con um, conversion problems. We offered up first to have nonprofits buy the SRO and develop them and keep them affordable. So we could look for those options. Homelessness, I'll just say right now, there's no clear evidence that it leads to it, but there was a concern and so people have looked into it. Um, the other thing that is a concern, and this is what I'm gonna kind of close out on, is that the targets, that is the people you're trying to actually benefit, may not benefit. You always hear those stories, right, of that rich person in New York who found that rent-controlled apartment, they're staying in it, they're, you know, they make a lot of money. Well, there is some evidence maybe that they're at the individual level that might happen, but most of the research shows collectively that the rents, that, sorry, the income levels for tenants in rent controlled areas compared to the outside of that in non-rent controlled areas are typically lower. So on average, we are getting the targets, but that is a concern, and that leads me to sort of some closing questions for you all to think about as we move forward in trying to move this bill forward and move forward the larger sort of things that people are talking about here today. First, we have to think who to target for the benefit. That is, is it time and community? So we raised our hands to how many people who lived here seven years or more uh, or less. Uh, do we look at income level? Uh, do we have to look at family size? Are we more concerned about the size? You know, larger families have harder times finding um, apartments. Do we look at the age? So uh, questions about um, seniors being evicted. Do we look at special needs like disability or acce um, accessible housing concerns? We have to ask what to target. Is it a limited geography, just like the targeted neighborhoods that are experiencing the most displacement? Or do we want to go citywide? 
Um, do we want to have it to think about things about like the age of a building? Some communities have done that. So older buildings are protect are actually part of rent control, and newer ones aren't, which is kind of an interesting question to raise. And I I, I would say that's really kind of a bad design. Um, there's also questions about like watching areas with low vacancy rates because that's the, the economic model again is that was. Um, uh, demand goes up and supply goes down, your rents are going to go up, right, to respond to that. The third uh, area is to ask how much control, the control part is going to come back in here in this discussion. Is it just a rate for raising the rent every year? Is it a cap on how high rent can go, maybe by bedroom size, or like we do for fair market rents in the city? Uh, do we have maintenance requirements tied to it? Uh, so finally, I want to return to the issue of displacement. Thinking of those questions, we're going to have to grapple with them. But let's really get back to the issue that we're all here for, which is about dealing with displacing and letting people stay in the community, which, by the way, the rent control research shows you can do. Um, so if you go to San Francisco Bay area, there was research done by, um, by some researchers at Berkeley. Um, and what they found was that in neighborhoods uh, with, uh, they had lower rates of displacement in neighborhoods that had rent control than did not. And I, could go into, you can, I can get you the resources to look at that as well. There's also research that was done, interestingly, on the impact of gentrification in uh, low-income people in New York City, and they concluded that they were not necessarily forced to move, but when looking at the, so it was this idea, it was like, look, low-income people get to stay in gentrifying areas. It was like, yay! And then but we really looked at it, people like me and other um, maybe more cynical researchers about this, about this, cynical about this particular research part, project, we said, well, wait, no, it just proved that rent control worked because most of the people that they were seeing who stayed had rent controlled apartments. So there you go. We've got evidence to say that this is something we should do. So if you have any questions about this or you want to see the resources, I can give them to you. Thank you. So as in right now, we're going to have uh, community participation. And the way that we, we are going to do it since uh, we have around 20 minutes or so. Uh, if a little bit more. OK, so anybody who wants to ask a question will come over here and direct the question to whoever you want to ask the question. So uh, yeah. just a really quick question. Um, uh, to our representatives, you said help us, help us lobby. How? Do we write letters? Do we, are we calling? Are we emailing? What are we doing? All of the above. Um, so um, when a bill is being considered in committee or uh, when it gets out of committee and goes to the floor for a vote, you know, those are critical times when uh, your voices really make a difference because the real estate lobby is going to be, you know, as uh, Representative Gazzardi was saying, you know, they have all their members send out mass emails telling us um, their opinions. Well, we want to hear your opinions too, and I think that, you know, that would sway some of our colleagues who might not be on board. And so, you know, any opportunity that you have, whether it's um, emailing, calling, I mean, you know, if you live in my district, you don't have to <laughs> uh, convince me because I'm already a co-sponsor, but, you know, there are, um, you know, 116 of our colleagues who, um, you know, may not hear a different perspective than that of the real estate lobby, so. I want to add two quick things to that. One is that um, even if you do live in either my or Representative Monster, call us and email us and let us know because it's always helpful for us to have those your stories as ammunition. Uh, it, again, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you got the word in my head now. <laughs> uh, as uh, fodder, I don't know. Uh, as, uh, as evidence, evidence, evidence. example, evidence. illustrative, powerful examples of uh, why this is important. Uh, and the other thing is that. Um, if you coordinate with the organizations who are part of our coalition working on this, I would I would recommend that strongly. Don't don't you know? There's no time for a million free agents, right? We need to band together and work together on this. And these organizations are going to be thinking strategically about which legislators do we need to target? Like who? It's in committee in front of these legislators. So here's the five phone numbers that you need to call today. So why they're going to be able to. It's so important. Why don't they spear? Uh, if you guys elect somebody or or appoint somebody to spearhead the. Uh, yeah, Pardon, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. It's so important why don't they order or, uh, you know, like, like spearhead the, the opposition to the uh, 
you know, for the stuff, because otherwise it's just kind of sporadic. And oh, so, so there's a, um, yeah, Jawanza will speak to that at the end, but there's a great coalition that already exists of uh, existing community organizations and, and renters' rights groups who have banded together. And yeah, so in terms of the, how this work is going to be done, I think Jawanza will talk to that at the very end. But you're right, we got to focus our efforts for sure. I know, I know, sorry, I know people have questions. We have a stack, so I want to give everyone has a chance. Everyone here that has a question has a chance. Um, we have, yeah, we're just, just going to go with the order real quick, for favor. Um, try to keep it quick, two minutes tops, for favor. Okay, and everyone else who wants to speak, please. For, for start, my only question is, uh, how can we trust you? <laughs> <laughs> my only question is, how can we trust you, all of you guys? Can it's I? not funny. Yeah, no. We're losing I, our homes. Yeah, we I understand. We can barely have more food. We can barely have anything. Yeah. It's not really a joke. I'm sorry. I don't think it's nothing funny at all. So how can I trust you? All of them, yeah. not just you, even the lawyer back there, right. even the doctor back there, even you, Mrs. Mrs. Teresa Ma, how can we trust you? An elder man is not even here. So, can I? Uh, sure, please. I would say that um, you shouldn't, actually. Um, yeah. You shouldn't trust any of us. I think too often in politics, uh, people just put their faith and their hope and their trust in a person, and they're like, that, whatever that person says, they're the boss, right? This kind of hero worship stuff has got to stop. Um, what you need to do, instead of trusting us, is pressure us. You need to organize us. And you're here tonight, so I know that you're capable of it. Um, we, you know, we will tell you what we believe in and the values that we have, and we're going to fight for them. But when you see us working against those values, my man doesn't even want to hear the answer to this question. That's cool. Uh, uh, for the rest of you, no, 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 it's all good. Uh, but for the rest of you, I, I'm really serious about this. Like, um, Teresa Ma is an amazing legislator. Uh, and you shouldn't just blindly trust her to do everything right. You should be in relationship with her. You should come to her office. You should talk to her. You should learn about the issues you care about. And when she does the right thing, you should thank her. And when she does the wrong thing, you should organize and push back, right? That's the kind of relationship we need to be in. If you want us to be really working in your interest, you can't just vote for us and trust us and walk away. We need that long-term relationship. Uh, is this working? Yeah. Okay. And along those lines, I, I, I want to call, and I'm going to use this word, I want to call bullshit on that. And I want to call bullshit on the, this myth of ammunition. Uh, I'm part of a group of uh, organizers, grassroots, we're independent for this for this same reason. Uh, if we have research, right, and some of it was mentioned here, if we have research on our side, not just about sh not just a sh uh, local research like the one that was published by Morhi Center, but we're, uh, we're talking years back in New York, Harlem, uh, Portugal, London, right? We have research that goes that way back. We know that this isn't a new phenomenon, and we actually have the blueprints in other cities how uh, developers work with politicians and such. Uh, so it's baffling to me that there's a lack of urgency uh, by politicians. It's baffling to me that even though disproportionately communities of color, low income communities of color are being displaced, that that makes it a social justice issue. That we're not framing it that way. Uh, and our local officials aren't either. Uh, and it's, and it's, so then it just begs the question, of, if it's a social justice issue, if, it's, um, if we have enough research that shows that uh, a tr uh, trail projects like the Paseo uh, will displace people, will lead to a further gentrified neighborhood. So if we have all this research on our side, uh, the question was raised of like, okay, well then who makes the decisions, right? And so we elect local officials. Uh, so I guess my comment here is that also kind of question, uh, why do local politicians take money from developers? So we have Teresa Ma who's taking 10,000 from Bill Capitori. And we have, we have Danny Solis who's taking money from developers. So why do they take money from developers? And then why don't we see organizations like the Resurrection Project ally themselves with Danny Solis who's taking money from developers? Uh, what, what, is it, uh, what is the purpose of, of something like that? Uh, and that's why I call it a myth of ammunition because developers don't have a heart. Developers aren't going to be like, oh yeah, they're protesting. Let's 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 stop our, our profiteering move here, right? So who do we trust, especially if we have politicians that are taking money from developers? That question's wrong. <laughs> I, yeah, I wouldn't mind yeah. answering it. Um, um, you know, I. Um, 
I was asked about this at another event about um, the particular contribution that you um, were referring to and um, in fact that was an in-kind contribution where I used um, a, uh, an event space for a celebration, for my inaugural celebration, that was free to everyone in the community to attend. Um, and, you know, because of um, political uh, campaign reporting requirements, right, we're uh, required to be transparent about uh, the value of the uh, contributions that, that we take in. And we make these reports every quarter. You know, the stated value of that event space was supposedly $7,000. Um, and, you know, so that was what was reported, right? But, you know, I, um, I also said, you know, when I was previously asked about this, that, um, you know, there is no quid pro quo. You know, when I take contributions from anybody, um, it is so that I can serve the community. You know, um, we are given very little to run our district offices. And, you know, my uh, political fund is actually used to subsidize um, salaries of my staff, to pay for rent. Um, you know, a lot of those things that make it possible for me to be accessible and open and to serve the community. And, you know, I, I um, wholeheartedly agree with what my colleague said about keeping us accountable. You know, I, you know, I come to community events um, and I listen to, you know, what you have to say because I care. And, you know, I don't mind when I'm, you know, asked about um, or challenged about my decisions. Um, you know, that's, that's great and that's part of this civic engagement process. It's part of the democratic process. You know, I'm completely open to that. Um, you know, and I said before that, you know, I don't stand with developers. You know, I don't agree with displacement or gentrification in this community. I want to work with you um, to do what I can to stop that. Um, but, you know, it's only possible for me to uh, stay in office if, you know, I raise money in order to um, get reelected because, you know, the, the honest truth is you can't win an election with zero money in your political account. So, you know, in order to serve all of you, I take contributions from, you know, whoever wants to, you know, give the contributions. It's a, you know, the requirement is that we're transparent. It's reported quarterly on our, um, you know, reports that are public at the Board of Elections. Um, and so, you know, you can see who gives me money and you can see whether there was any quid pro quo. And, you know, obviously, you know, since I'm one of the co-sponsors of a bill that developers and realtors hate, um, you know, there's no quid pro quo right there. So, you know, you can decide for yourself. But um, I appreciate, you know, the rest of the comments. I agree that it's a human rights issue, that, you know, housing is a human right. We should all care about that. We should all care about, um, you know, making sure people are treated in a humane way, and um, you know, I'm behind you on all that. I mean, just for the record, I want to give an example. I just want to say that, that I think that uh, when you then tell us that you need pressure from us, sometimes like, that doesn't equate to the seven thousand dollars or that free space that was used, um, and it, it makes us feel like at the end of the day, we can hit the streets, we can email you. Uh, but we don't have the $7,000 or we don't have that kind of influence that developers will have. Um, so so I, I, I don't speak to you anymore and I speak to everybody else and I say to make a conscious decision of who we're voting for uh, during elections. Uh, like Alderman Solis who's not here and who has taken money from developers. Um, and Teresa Ma who can give her explanation but it is up, up to us to determine uh, who is representing us, and if it's really true that all it takes is an email from us or some kind of protest, because it doesn't seem that way. Thank you. Uh, no sé inglés como para poderme explicar 
para que todo se entienda. Pero mi pregunta es, yo vivo en Proyecto de Resurrección en el Building para los Simios, ¿sí? ah, que vivimos de un cheque fijo, porque no hemos tenido aumentos. Y nos están subiendo la renta, nos avisaron un 25% de un jalón, más de 120 dólares, 130. Eh, mi pregunta es, acabo de oír que dice usted que no hay ley para, para las rentas. Uh, ¿Qué podemos hacer entonces? Nada. Quedarnos ahí hasta que ya no podamos pagar y nos tengamos que salir. So, Uh, so the lady here is, lives in um, Resurrection Project and for a senior and a senior housing, and she's asking that um, what she can do because her rent was raised around 25 percent, and they live uh, by a pension check, which is not that much, and she's asking uh, Will Busardi what what is there something that she could do about that because uh she wants to stay there and she doesn't know what can she do about that yo he oído muchos muchas historias como la suya en mi comunidad y en comunidades en toda la ciudad y es por eso que me importa tanto este es propuesto de ley que, uh, que estoy escuchando ahora. Porque ahora mismo no hay protecciones para usted. Uh, es una situación terrible, pero es la verdad. No hay protecciones en la ley para familias con la suya. Uh, entonces, ¿qué puede hacer usted en ese momento? Um, Afortunadamente hay unas organizaciones aquí en es, esta noche y, y en la comunidad que tratan de ayudar a, a personas en su situación. Entonces, por favor, hable con ellos y a ver lo que pueden hacer ellos para ayudarle a pagar la renta que está subiendo. Uh, pero uh, por el futuro tenemos que cambiar esa ley para que podamos escribir nuevas protecciones para personas como, como usted, para que la renta no puede subir tanto. Pero según tengo entendido, uh, a los niños, uh -huh. como yo que vivo sola, uh -huh. no nos pueden cobrar cuando están, estamos en un edificio así, más del 30% de nuestro cheque. Eso sí es una ley. Uh -huh. so, let me, let me ask. Yo, yo voy a preguntar a los abogados <laughs> sobre esa pregunta. So, she's saying that um, there's a law that says for seniors that they can't uh, take more than 30% of their uh, paycheck in, in rental costs. Um, well, the only kind of uh, rent control that we know about is people who have um, federally subsidized housing or housing that is supported by tax breaks to rich people so to keep rents under control in those limited kind of housing of which there are about 40,000 units in the city of Chicago there the renters rent is capped at 30 percent of their income so that's an exception most renters don't have that benefit does resurrection um, project qualify for that I, I i don't know the resurrection situation personally because a lot of a lot of buildings the obligation, if they're in one of these programs, the obligation can sometimes run to the whole building, but sometimes only to certain units in the building. Entonces, so I can't form a generalization without knowing the particulars. Por favor, hable con la comité de, de abogados aquí, porque ellos van a saber los, uh, uh, los detalles de su situación, okay? okay gracias. gracias a usted. Aquí está el ¿Por qué no because like, like what they were saying that they should talk to community organizations, but they are living in a in a TRP building that's from a community organization, and they they all got their they all got notices, twenty five percent rent increase. So it, it'd be nice to you know we can do something about that. Like it'd be nice if maybe you all can kind of talk to TRP, maybe somebody can take a pay cut or something instead of the seniors coming to 
more. Okay, let me suggest something else, all right? Because the law isn't necessarily going to help in this regard, organizing does. The Metropolitan Tenants Organization, the Pilsen Alliance, the Autonomous Tenants Union, and other groups will um, work with Lawyers Committee for Better Housing and other groups to come out and organize that particular building of tenants. Um, there might be legal handles that we can identify there, um, but certainly just the public pressure of those renters working cooperatively. What do we call this in the old-fashioned American language? A union, say it, union. $15 an hour, a union. Free health care, a union. Profit out of the housing market, a union. And so when we take control of democracy, not by just voting once every four years for the same two capitalist parties, but being directly responsible, which means that you have to turn off the television and the football game and everything else that they do to pacify us, including pitting black communities against Hispanic communities, and women against men, and workers against everybody. So when we pull the veil off and see how bankrupt their system is, we begin to work together to make concrete decisions. And the answer to the question about can you trust, I guess, me, the answer is quite simple. In the face of overwhelming odds, power never relinquishes power without a push. Rosa Parks wasn't some older black woman that refused to give up her seat. That was an organized protest by an organized group. We always accomplish things in groups, not the heroism of individuals, but of groups collectively. And so what we need to do is to say, we need to regain our strength as a people in democracy by winning small things. We win this small thing today together. We gain confidence, we gain momentum. We win the next small thing, we gain confidence, we gain momentum. In the meantime, what she can do is contact the Pilsen Alliance and the Metropolitan Tenants Organization, get four or five of her neighbors to get together, we'll have an organizing meeting, and we'll see how they do when we have a rent strike. Thank you so much, Frank. So we have a Well, I was really hoping somebody from the Alderman's office or Alderman's police would be here tonight to hear our concerns. <clears throat> One thing I would like to say to them is the 24% strict low income control in Pilsen is non existent because landlords can pay a fee to opt out of that. That needs to go. We will never have enough affordable housing unless that goes away. My other question is for Frank. You were talking about proactive inspections and landlords fixing their properties and that kind of thing. In the city of Chicago, it is my understanding through talking to the building department that every one of those 600,000 rental units is supposed to be inspected once a year. That is what I was told by the building department. So um, what happens is, is that um, for, for, yeah, I'm sure. Why is this going to be translated? Is the translator working? No, no, no. Lo que estaba, la pregunta que estaba haciendo el señor es acerca de las inspecciones de cada unidad que hay una ley que the law states that they gotta like once a year they gotta do the inspections right que cada año se tiene que hacer los inspecciones entonces la pregunta es para el abogado Frank Avalon que sabe más de ese tema. Okay, so there's something called a conservation inspection for buildings of greater than 20 units. Well, you just eliminated most of the units in Chicago, and that only happens occasionally. The building department and the Department of Public Health are under-resourced. They can't possibly meet the task of their job. Um, I do want to give you a sense of hope. The advocacy community, Pilsen Alliance, Metropolitan Tenants Organization, etc., the Kenwood Oakland Neighborhood Organization, all these organizations have this bill ready to go for proactive rental inspection. We have now joined forces with the public health community 
um, and the hospitals and the doctors and the nurses, we're scheduled to have a final product done by November with an open lobbying campaign of city council come January. Be on the lookout for it. Be ready to come and testify. Be ready to, to write some letters. Um, keep in touch with the Pilsen Alliance. They'll let you know this has a good chance of, of really getting traction. There is a special focus in this legislation for lead contamination of small children. My other thing is, when it comes to landlords and getting any reaction from the city, my wife and I are going through everything that has been said here tonight. I have called 311 and the alderman's office since the middle of June probably 25 times. I have been told by the alderman's office, 311, the Chicago Police Department, the Sheriff's Department, that there is not one person in the state of Illinois that can enforce the laws and make them fix their property, clean it up, or anything like that. Why? I would say, uh, sounds like you need a good lawyer, and there's why, a little table of them right why over is there. there. Why is there nobody in the city, or the county, or the state, all they can do is write violations. Oh, okay. These rich these rich landlords, they don't care about a $500 fine. They just oh, pay okay. it, and they don't fix, or they don't sure. clean it up. So let me, let me clarify, this yeah. is really kind of a resource issue problem because the city law department and the building department, in fact, bring <laughs> building code violation cases all the time. There are two kinds. One where they just sort of nurse the landlord along to help them do minor things. But then there's the big kind of case where they're shutting the building down. And what we would like to see happen is that buildings never get to that point. So the city does bring those cases, but those departments are so under-resourced that they can't do it at any scale or magnitude to have an effect on an entire neighborhood, much less a whole city. So there's nobody so there can are make them fix the broken window, fix the heater, get the rat out of the apartment. They can and the occasionally do, it's just too low, low scale. And um, sometimes our organization will file lawsuits in court um, uh, when, and partnering with uh, some of the other organizations here when we organize a building of tenants uh, uh, to force repairs. But again, these are all things that are under-resourced. El señor preguntó de que si hay alguien en la ciudad que pueda uh, ayudarles cuando se necesita arreglar algo de los edificios y lo que pasa es que los developers, está, ellos pueden pagar las multas de 500 rápidamente, entonces el señor Frank le contesta de que uh, resulta que sí hay casos que se han llevado uh, a la ciudad y se han llevado a corte, pero lamentablemente estos, estos uh, uh, organizaciones o, o lugares que ayudan en esa área uh, no reciben mucho dinero para um, hacer estos casos. Este, bueno, vamos a seguir con las preguntas. Uh, nada más tenemos un minuto más. Oh, mi nombre es Héctor Duarte y felicito mucho esta iniciativa de ley. Eh, yo creo que la única respuesta aquí sería nosotros todos asumir la responsabilidad para buscar firmas, ayudar en ese sentido con las firmas, que eso es lo que están oponiendo allá en, en el espejo. Entonces, por ese lado, yo creo que había, habíamos de organizarnos todos. ¿sí? Ok, so Mr. Duarte aquí, who is an artist uh, from Pilsen, uh, he's saying that he wants to congratulate. Uh, the representatives for having this bill uh, put in, in Springfield, but he is also saying that we need to unite and organize ourselves, and we need to help them to get petitions, to get signatures, to go out there and talk to the people of our community. Uh, <laughs> We, yeah, a commercial. We are also organizing here in Pilsen on many different levels, and we wanted to present. I'm, I'm Linda Lutton, I'm Hector Duarte's wife, a 24 year resident here. My kids were born down the street. Um, and we are, uh, we've been working with other people on the Pilsen Housing Cooperative, PICO. We have a name, we have a steering committee, and we want to do exactly what these developers are doing. We want to buy the buildings that people are 
are selling, but we want them for long time Pilsen residents. Our focus is on families and Latino artists. Those are the two groups that are at huge risk of the displacement. Those are the groups that have given Pilsen its character, and those are the groups that we're targeting. Um, and we invite you to leave your name with us today and your email, a way to get a hold of you. And we are gonna be reaching out to Representative Gazzardi and Representative Ma because uh, we are proposing a limited equity co-op so people could gain equity the way homeowners can, but up to a point, not make a killing, not see property as a profit. Um, and we think if we are willing to give up some of our wealth to keep affordable, to keep housing affordable far into the future, we shouldn't be taxed, limited equity co-ops shouldn't be taxed at the same rates. So we, we definitely are gonna be visiting with the representatives and looking for changes on, on tax policy um, in that regard. El maestro Duarte, eh, ella está hablando que ellos formaron un comité que es para uh, precisamente lo mismo que están haciendo los developers. Uh, uh, ellos quieren comprar edificios, pero quieren uh, apoyar a las familias de Pilsen y quieren apoyar a los artistas para mantener mantenerlos en un lugar que sea asequible para ellos. Uh, Actually, not, me. So, uh, not more of a question, but again, uh, more of a gratitude. Thanks for all of you to come out here. It, it took a lot for you to do that, and uh, thank you for the organization. Uh, what I want to do again is challenge all of you. Again, it's we need to. I've been in Pilsen since 1973. Do I look that old? No. no. <laughs> 44. Pilsen is good. Pilsen's been good. Uh, 16th and, and Carpenter. So right down the street. I grew up to work Park. Come here. Fights, other things, getting beat up, beating other people. Anyway, <laughs> we love this community. Take pride in your community. I challenge you all. I, I grew up, I went to school with Danny Soli's children. Okay, and they were laughing stock then. He's a laughing stock now. He's not here. I take I say this here to all of you. Be the change you want to see. You do it. You know, I'm gonna run. My name is Shy Delano Roosevelt. There's gonna be another Roosevelt in office. Understand, it. understand, it. understand. It. You be the change. Stop. You know, we love them. But they're doing the best they can. They're not. It's not the crooked thing. It's so. It's it's like the the person. You have to learn about the law. Whoever knows about the law has the power. They don't know everything about the law. Don't put them on the hot seat. You need. You take pride in learning yourself. Okay. You're getting evicted. What did you? You. I learned. I didn't go to college. I did every. I learned everything in the library. That was my college, and my alma mater is Chicago Public Library. Do something. Learn something. You do it. Thank you all, and I thank you all for coming. Be the change you want to be. You run for office. I'm gonna do it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and come and get you one of these cupcakes, they good. <laughs> okay, we have one more person, and then we're gonna have uh, Jawansa. Hi, my name is Willie Green. I work at MTO uh, with Miguel. And I'm the gentleman that do all the calling for you when you call us. We have Spanish conference down. I'm the gentleman that return all calls when the clients call us having problems with landlords. I'm very good at it. I'm one of the best that there is. I've been doing this for over 10 years. I do it as a volunteer. I truly enjoy trying to help the tenants. I ride around on buses and trains, passing these flyers out every day and explaining tenants about their rights. I'm Willie Green. I'm also going to be going on uh, that channel, channel 5 and respond also, hopefully letting you all know I've been fighting for these rights in this 17 years this city has done this to people who gave up their project. This is totally, unbelievably wrong. Thank you. Thank you. One quick question. I was wondering why, um, as a legislative tool, they don't pass a law to get rid of the escape clause so that there's no more, you can pay the $500 bill or the tax or whatever, now it's like, no, there is no pay your way out. You must, you must provide housing at an affordable rate or nothing. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. Um, and it's, uh, unfortunately, we don't have any members of city council here to, to answer that question, as, as has been, uh, so it, yeah, so it's a city, it's a city ordinance, so, but, but let me, I'll tell you. This is, you're talking about, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, I'll say briefly that when this ordinance, the city ordinance was passed, the idea behind this part was, um, you know, if you're building a brand new luxury development downtown where there's not a lot of need for affordable housing, that the money could go into a pot and that could be used for affordable housing in other neighborhoods. Unfortunately, as you're correctly pointing out, we haven't seen that kind of development of affordable housing in the neighborhoods that need it. And instead, what they're doing is precisely what you're saying. I, I see it in Logan Square every day. They put up these huge new towers. And instead of putting all the affordable in there, you know, they pay into a little kitty and then they don't bother. So we got we to gotta address that problem, I agree. Oh, you said one quick one, man. <laughs> Transparency. Who were the politicians at the state level who passed that law back way back then? That's why I want to yeah. report. Because okay. we need to vote them out. Yeah. yeah. Not that many of them left from 1995, but there's still a couple. <laughs> okay. Um, we're, we're running out of time. I want to thank everybody here for sticking around. We do have a couple very, very important announcements. I think that concluded the community participation aspect of this event. So we want to thank everyone for sticking it out, asking really, really great questions. Um, I do want to I do want to send a shout out. We do have uh, uh, Pilsen and Defensa, so it's an immigration defense group that the Pilsen Alliance is organizing with other community organizations in Pilsen to address uh, the fear of deportation <laughs> and um, the expiration of the DACA program. So we also have Oscar here, who also helps people with DACA. So if anyone has any issues with DACA, they want to renew their DACA, please talk to Oscar. He's, he's, he's we're here to help. So I forgot to mention that, but they're here. So if anyone needs that information, also we have MTO Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. Please take advantage of the resources they have. If there's a question that we weren't able to answer, please you know talk to them. That's why they're here. Um, Monday. Oh yeah, Tony. <laughs> Tony Diaz in the back. In case you all want to save some money on, on your uh, is it like electricity, right? So anyway, you guys just go around the table for you guys, leave, okay? Look, this is the last step, the next step. Uh, what do we do from here, right? What's the next step? We talked about rent control. Gracias. We talked about rent control and, and uh, we want to keep the momentum going, okay? So I want to bring uh, Brother Joanza Malone from the Lift the Bank Coalition so he can tell you what's up next. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So quickly, because I'm the last thing keeping you all from going home, uh, I just want to say that I really appreciate uh, the representatives and attorneys and professors and all of you being here tonight to talk about this important issue. We've heard the stories of how our communities are being colonized, decimated, we're being pushed out. I want you to know, in case you didn't know, that it's not just here in Pilsen. It's happening in Uptown. It's happening in Logan Square. It's happening in Bronzeville in my community. When we launched this campaign, it was because an 84-year-old woman that I've known almost the entire time I've worked in Kenwood, who's on a fixed income, who's lived in a building for the majority of her adult life, is being pushed out at 84. Ok, bueno, pues él es el último que los está uh, haciendo que se queden un ratito más. Eh, lo que él está diciendo es que lo que está pasando aquí en Pilsen está pasando en muchos otros lugares. Entonces, uh, la campaña que eh, muchas otras comunidades de, de Chicago, como es Logan Square, Uptown, y entonces esta campaña se, se empezó porque hay una persona que él conoce de toda su vida que tiene 84 años. Y esa persona de 84 años que vive de un cheque de uh, pensión, uh, la quieren sacar de donde ella vive. A developer out of New Jersey bought the building that she lives in eight years ago. And she went from paying $425 to $900 every single month. Before she wasn't paying utilities, now she's paying utilities. Her monthly income is nine hundred dollars. Entonces, uh, un uh, developer compró el edificio de hace ocho años y entonces ahora ella 
fue de pagar una renta de 400 dólares a 900 dólares, en donde ella tiene que pagar también a lo que es a electricidad, agua, todos los, los biles que hay que pagar. Y resulta que ella recibe un income de cada mes de 900 dólares, que es lo que lo, le quieren cobrar de renta. And so her children have been helping her out, but they just can't do it anymore. And so at 84, she has to go apartment hunting to try to find some place to live. And so Representative Gazzardi is right. We have to make sure that we're the ones who are out there knocking on the doors and making sure that we hold our elected officials accountable so that this horrible law that was passed to make rich people richer gets overturned. Okay, los hijos de esta señora la han tratado de ayudar a pagar todos sus biles, pero ya no pueden seguir este, ayudándole. Entonces, a 84, en 84 años que ella tiene, la señora tiene que salir a buscar un apartamento nuevo donde vivir. Entonces, él dice que Will Sari tiene razón, que tenemos que salir allá afuera y tenemos que ser nosotros los que estemos en la comunidad hablando con la gente y organizando a todos. And so here's what we need you to do. There's three things. Number one, Hilton Alliance along with other groups around the city, are launching a referendum campaign. So we are going to get on the ballot a question asking all of you if you want to bring rent control, rent stabilization here to Chicago. It's going to be on a March primary ballot across the city, and we need you to make sure it happens. <laughs> Una de las primeras cosas que tenemos que hacer es que uh, la Alianza de Pilsen junto con otras organizaciones en coalición vamos a, a, estar un ref, uh, a poner un referéndum en el próximo ballot, uh, carta de, de votación en donde vamos a poner que tenemos que traer lo que es control de renta a la ciudad de Chicago y nosotros vamos a comenzar eso y lo vamos a hacer posible. So, on September 18th, 4 o'clock, Casa Aslan, Moore will give you all the instructions. He's working out the, the walk sheets. We're going to launch this referendum campaign right here in this neighborhood. 30 people from across the city are coming right here to launch this campaign. We're going door to door, getting a petition signed to make sure that we got 15 precincts just in this area, the signs want to make sure that this gets on the ballot next March. Thank you. So, para, para marzo, vamos a tener una coalición de toda la ciudad de Chicago. 30 personas van a venir aquí para salir y lanzar esta campaña y vamos a salir a, a buscar peticiones para traer lo que es control de renta en 15, en 15 uh, distritos, no, precintos. precintos, en 15 precintos de aquí de Pilsen. So vamos a lanzar esta campaña aquí en Pilsen y vamos a empezar a salir y agarrar peticiones y agarrar firmas y, y los vamos a necesitar a todos en esto. So we need you there and we need you every day after that, there we're going door to door to make sure that our community understands what's at stake. That there is a way to stay in this neighborhood, but we got to bring that fight to them. The last thing, September 28th, in a Bronzeville neighborhood, we're having a citywide town hall on this issue. We're bringing in a lawyer from New York who's been on a rent control board there for 10 years. He's coming here to Chicago. We're bringing an organizer from Oakland who worked to pass rent control across the Bay Area, she's coming here to Chicago to talk to us to make sure we understand how we can get this done. Okay, so September 20th? Yep. So, in September 28th, va a vamos a tener un referéndum y va a venir uh, un abogado, a lawyer from, uh, de Nueva York, y va a venir para ayudarnos y a contestar preguntas. Vamos a tener una, una organiz, un organizador de... ¿Dónde está el organizador? 
from the Oakland para venir y, a, y contestar nuestras preguntas y ayudarnos a hacer esto posible. Así que el referéndum va a ser, el fórum, perdón, va a ser el 28 de septiembre. You can find out more information about this from this man right here. Pilsen Alliance is at the forefront of this fight. You are, your neighborhood is on the map. Right here, where we are, is leading the fight for this campaign. We're in solidarity with you. Be in solidarity with us. Thank you again for coming out tonight. I want to see all of you next week. Thank you, Dave. Uh, that should conclude our evening for tonight. Muchísimas gracias por todos estar aquí con nosotros esta noche. Como dice Joanza, the work's going to continue. So thank you all for coming out here. Uh, please make your home safe. Um, there are some petitions outside. If you all are interested in signing some petitions for some uh, elected officials, go for it. Uh, yeah, también queremos agradecer a los representantes que vinieron hoy. Uh, Teresa Ma, un aplauso, por favor. Yeah,